Eva. By all the stars in the universe, this thing is heavy, I practically shouted as I tried to lug the Terran's mech back to his room. What is even in here? Stones used for combat rituals? I heard Alex chuckle on my shoulder. Well, if you want to know, there's a water filtration system, an air filtration system, the ocular system, enough rations to survive a month or so, the moving parts that actually make the mech move, some extremely proprietary technology that I'm not supposed to even know about, the power generator and its various backups, and the batteries that run the thing. I took a brief break as I leaned against a wall and looked at Alex. Oh, that actually reminds me. You remember when we were talking and I mentioned methane? I nodded. Well, like I said earlier, we don't breathe it. But the batteries and power generator on this bad boy actually runs on methane, which is why you see it being put into the suits every now and again. These things may run forever, but that doesn't mean that they don't require fuel every so often. I grunted in surprise. Really? You actually use methane? And how is it that you are able to fit so much into such a small package? If we tried to fit everything you just mentioned, it would probably be half the size of the ship. Yeah, we actually use methane. I don't really understand the science behind it, but something about it is a kind of super fuel for some kind of chain reaction or another. But as to why we can fit so much into so little space, it really has to do with size being the main factor. Us humans, being so small, make things so small and efficient that when you build on a scale like the mech, it's kind of hard not to follow that design philosophy. This case, like all cases in human history, results in each system except for a couple being so redundant that it never sees use. But like I said, humans don't really like empty space in their creations, hence the redundancies in the first place. Does that make sense? I suppose it does. I said as I tried to pick the mech back up. But couldn't you have made it lighter? That got a loud laugh out of Tiny Human. Well, there's only so much that the research and development department can do to make it this lightweight. This is lightweight? I can barely carry this thing? I shouted as I rounded the final corner. The goal is in sight. Just a bit longer. Well, compared to the first generation mechs that were made when humans still fought wars against each other about half a century ago, this is a feather in comparison, he said as we finally got to the door. He thought for a moment as I punched in the commands for the door to open. Come to think of it, though, mechs really didn't have a military advantage to them because all it would take to destroy one is a single dickhead with a way to call a stonk on your position. I stopped. A stonk? I asked slowly. Yeah a concentrated artillery bombardment. Do you guys not have those? No, we do, I said defensively. We just don't call them that. Well, what do you call them? Alex asked. Just concentrated artillery bombardments, I guess. We don't really have a term for it, I said, finally having gotten the door open. Well, that's boring, said Alex with a snort. Oh, wow, I said as I looked around the room. It looked like the workshop of a tiny creature that just happened to live in this space as well. Considering Alex, that assumption wasn't all that far off. In the corner nearest to the bed was a stand that had hooks on it. I immediately registered this as where he must have put his mech whenever he wasn't using it. Next to the stand was what looked like a tiny elevator that not only serviced the mech stand but the bed as well. And since these Terrans seemed keen on having redundancy after redundancy in their systems and objects in general, Right next to the elevator was no less than three sets of ladders that ran the height of the tiny structures. My eyes were then drawn to the rest of the room. The closet was almost completely empty, except for some boxes that were clearly meant to be openable by someone of Alex's height. The desk, on the other hand, was a completely different story. It had the same elevator ladder situation as the bed did. It was also absolutely covered from end to end in various tiny machines and gadgets that I didn't even begin to understand what they were. The bed was the only thing that looked normal in the entire room. I like what you did with the place, I said, slowly taking it all in. You've got a lot of stuff going on here. Alex shuffled around nervously. Well, it's not like I have very many visitors here, and considering with how bad at cleaning I am, this is extremely clean for me. Right, I said, making my voice drip with as much sarcasm as I can. Sure, I believe you. Oh, by the way, where do you want this? I asked, 
as I hefted up the mech and tried not to drop it, for fear of denting the floor of the ship. The mech you can leave on the stand, Alex said. It should automatically connect with the diagnostic system that I have on the desk to give me a more accurate diagnosis of the problem than the onboard computer will. I didn't even bother answering him as I strained and struggled to get the machine onto the hooks along the various parts of the stand. After a couple of minutes of struggling with that, I finally managed to get it to stand on its own. With that out of the way, I collapsed onto the bed with a groan, accidentally throwing Alex off my shoulder only for him to land harmlessly on the pillow. Remind me to never do a favor for you ever again. My muscles are on fire, I groaned. I looked over to see Alex still trying to regain his footing on the unstable pillow. Well, I'm not going to apologize for you being too nice to say no, he retorted with a laugh. As soon as he got his balance, he made his way over to the elevator and made his way down to the floor. I couldn't help but look down at him as he slowly made his way to the desk, up the elevator, and finally to what appeared to be a central computer sitting on the desk. He started to furiously type as he closed various programs just as quickly as he opened them again. I started to dose off for a couple of minutes when he clapped his hands rather loudly and said, Aha! That's the issue! This shouldn't take much time to fix it all. What? I asked, jolting awake while not fully processing what he said. He quickly turned around and looked a bit shocked that I spoke up. To be honest, I kind of forgot that you were here, but I was just saying that I figured out the problem. Like I was saying before, the battery got hit, and that's not very good because it kind of needs those to run. In any case, that should be easy to fix. It shouldn't take any more time than it would to just fabricate a whole new battery. The tricky part, however, is the movement matrix for the lower half of the mech was damaged a lot, and I don't have the schematics to fabricate another. Couldn't you just get the schematics? I asked. He thought for a moment. Well, I could, but that would take jumping through more legal loopholes than I would care to go through. He paused for a moment before continuing. I mean, at this point it would probably be a lot faster and cheaper to just fabricate a wheelchair or something like that so that I can stay mobile without the lower half of the mech working. I thought for a moment. Getting a wheelchair will be a bit difficult because medicine has gotten so good that needing one is kind of a thing of the past, but I'm sure that the fabricator can cook something up for your needs. Yeah, you're probably right. I wonder if... Alex was cut off by the sound of his personal communicator going off. I sat up and looked at him curiously as all the color in his face seemed to drain away, leaving him whiter than fresh snow on a mountain. What's wrong? I asked. It's a message from the United Terran Security Council. It says, due to a confirmed scenario 7, effective immediately, all non-essential Terrans not in Terran space are required to report to their nearest embassy. He looked up at me. This is bad, very bad. Alex. It's a message from the United Terran Security Council. It says, due to a confirmed Scenario 7, effective immediately, all non-essential Terrans not in Terran space are required to report to their nearest embassy. I looked up at Ava. This is bad, very bad. They immediately sat up from the lying position that they were in. Wait, why? What does that mean? Is that bad? They asked. Well, I suppose that depends on your definition of bad because for humans, it's pretty bad. Basically, there are ten different scenarios that United Nations of Terra have drawn up with the help of the Security Council that outlines different possible things that could happen. Those range from Scenario 1, where the secret goes out and nothing really changes, all the way to 10, where the secret goes out and the entire galactic community is gunning for us, so to speak. I could see the look of confusion on the much larger dinosaur's face as I said that. I took a deep breath and continued. So what that means is that the Security Council believes that there is a very real possibility that at least two or more different members of the galactic community will declare war on us as soon as the news gets out. That's why all Terrans are going to the embassies because those things are built like fortresses. Ava, taking a moment processing this information, feathers fluffing up before they finally said, but why would anyone declare war on you guys? Terrans have been nothing but helpful to the galactic community for as long as we've known about you. What could they possibly gain by going to war with you? I sat in the chair in front of the computer. 
beats me. My best guess is that there are some species out there that seem to like warmongering more than the average species. They might see the news that the imposing Terrans in their impervious spacesuits were easily puntable the whole time, and think to themselves, this has got to be the easiest war that we have ever fought. It's at times like this when I am really glad that we never revealed where our homeworld was. Ava was about to say something when suddenly the loudspeaker system on the ship crackled to life. I'm sure that it didn't really need to crackle like that. Maybe it was just a noise to inform the crew to start listening up. But I digress. Attention all crew, she started. We have been requested by the Terran government to ferry our resident Terran to the embassy ship's strength through diplomacy. We are about three weeks of travel time from its current location. I double-checked my computer terminal. That information seemed to be correct. Also, due to the urgency of the Terran government, we will not be stopping at any port of calls on the way. Out in the hallway, I could hear groaning coming from aliens probably trying to get a glimpse at me through a crack in the door or something similar. I know that this is not what you all signed up for, but I have been assured that we will be fairly compensated for our time and efforts. That is all. And with that, the loudspeaker went silent. I shook my head. Man, things must be heating up if they want me back so bad. I wonder if I'll get court-martialed for this, or maybe even declared excommunicado. At this point, the world is my oyster. Maybe, but we won't really know until we get there, I suppose. Oh, hey, did you want to get that battery and wheelchair fabricated so you can actually move around without needing me? They asked. That shook me out of my self-destructive thoughts. Yeah, totally. It shouldn't be that hard to link up my computer to the fabricator. If I had known how much trouble that that single statement got me into, I would have never said it in the first place. Connecting the two systems wasn't a problem. That actually came pretty easily due to various technological trades that have been happening for the last couple of years. That is where the ease stopped, however. The file for the schematic of the battery was in a specific format that was simply incompatible with the fabricator, and so I had to break out the most dreaded thing a human can think of, a user instruction manual. The manual, for one reason or another, was a physical copy and thicker than a bowl of oatmeal. Three hundred years after the invention of the ebook, and we still can't get away from physical copies of things. With nothing better to do, I started to pour over the manual, and after only thirty minutes of searching, I finally found the passage about changing the schematic format to something that alien fabricators can read and produce. With that passage found, it only took another 30 minutes or so to finally get the schematic formatted properly and sent to the ship fabricator. Thank the Lord that that's finally done, I shouted, waking Ava from the nap they were having. Wait, what's done? They asked. I finally figured it out, and the battery's being fabricated as we speak. Well, that's good, they said. You'll be up and moving soon enough. Yeah, I really hope so. Oh, by the way, could you send me the schematic for the wheelchair? I would use a schematic that humans use, but I'm terrible with modeling software, and I'm sure that I would mess it up somehow trying to scale it properly. They nodded before sending me the schematic. That one was easy enough to send to the fabricator due to it being the correct format, so there was nothing to worry about. Well, we have about an hour before both things are done being made, I said. So what do you want to do? To be honest with you, I just want to sleep. Today has been exhausting to no end, and I am ready to sleep, I chuckled. Yeah, me too. I was going to say more when my phone buzzed. I looked at it and saw that it was a message from the captain. It read, turn to galactic news, you're going to want to see this. My eyes widened, and I made my way to the computer and tuned it to the news station. It was strange because no matter where you went in the galaxy, the news shows looked almost exactly alike. There were always two anchors sitting behind a desk with the news agency's logo on it, and this news show was no exception. Instead of the humans sitting behind the desk like I had grown up with, there was instead two aliens. One looked just like Godzilla, the 2014 version, not the reboot from 30 years ago. And the other looked like a beaver with the body of a lion. It looked like they were in the middle of reporting something unprecedented move by the Terrans as a mass exodus from the galactic community to the various Terran embassies scattered throughout the galaxy.
This news comes minutes after images surfaced on the galactic web of a tiny hairless lemur riding on the shoulder of a koshale. The person who posted this has claimed that the lemur was what Terrans looked like underneath their spacesuits. They then showed a rather high-quality picture of me riding on the shoulder of Ava. It must have been taken on the bridge. Hey, Ava. Look, we're famous now, I said with little mirth. Ava, who was sitting on the bed the entire time, stood up and walked over to the desk and peered over me to get a good look at the photo that they were showing. They didn't even get my good side, they lamented. Yeah, well, maybe we'll get the chance to do a photo shoot later, I said, quickly silencing myself as the news report went on. To give us a better look into what we're seeing in this photo, we go now to our analyst, Ikid, Ikid. The camera cut to a giant spider-looking alien who was poring over a screen unseen by the camera. Thank you, Chusk. So as we can see from the image, specifically the resolution and the overall quality, we can see that this photo was not fabricated in any way and is the genuine article. As to the claims that this lemur thing is what Terrans look like under their spacesuits, I cannot verify at this time. But I can draw similarities between the proportions of the limbs and heads of these suits that the Terrans never seem to take off. But this begs the question of why the Terrans would lie about something like this in the first place. And if they're lying about this, then what else could they be lying about? I would say, but that's out of my area of expertise. Back to you, Chusk. The camera switched back to the anchors, and the Godzilla-looking one gave their species equivalent to a smile and said, Compelling stuff, thank you, Ikid. Well, that's all the time that we have today, but we will be covering this story as it unfolds. Until then, have a wonderful morning. With that, the ending jingle played and the broadcast was over. So much for BSing our way out of this one, I said, shaking my head.